Now we've got so a little bit of more understanding that it seems like there's some similar origin here. A lot of times people will try to tell you that, well, Muhammad, peace be upon him, copied all of this from the Bible. If he did, I'm going to promise you he didn't copy it from King James Bible, because that was nine, uh, no, that's a thousand years after him, because in the year 610 A.D., 610, is when he first got revelation, and King James Version is 1611. So if that's right, that's a thousand and one years later. So obviously it didn't go that way. But maybe he found, I'll be fair, if he found the Aramaic text, that would be pretty good, and he would be able to speak it because Aramaic and Arabic are the same. If you speak one person to the other Aramaic, to Arabic, it's the same talking. There, and by the way, there are only people left that I know of that are speaking Aramaic, the language of Jesus, are in Baladishem, which is uh, in Syria. It's a small, tiny little place where they are over there. And you can check out what I'm telling you just by go there and, and listen to them. And they're Christians. By the way, they, these are Christians. They're not Muslims. And they live in a Christian land. So the next thing we want to look at is this word Islam seems very nice, but how does it work when you put it in practice. Before anybody can understand the relationship or the verb of Islam, they have to understand the principle of it. The principle is describing relationship between you and the one who created you. Now in Arabic, there's a word called ilah. What is ilah? Anything that can be worshipped. Stick, stone, rock, tree, bone, anything you want to worship is an ilah. Most of us today don't relate to that because we think, well, huh, who, who would worship a, a, a statue or who would worship some kind of a, a, you know, tree or shrine? We wouldn't do that. But how about this? How about people who sit in front of the computer all day long? Or people who hang on a TV, t watch that TV all day? Or they're out at the golf course all the time? Or they're out doing whatever they like to do is what they spend their time and devotion on is worship. So that would be their ilah. Could be money. Could be power. Could be their own appearance, how they look to other people. Whatever they worship, that's their ilah. Then there's the word in Arabic which means the ilah. This would be in English where you would capitalize the G and it's no longer the little G. You put a big G and we know what that means. That's the God. Well, in Arabic, it's not only you, there is no capitals, but it's very clear because it says Al, which is the article the Allah, means the only one to worship. It's also God's name, by the way. To any Arab Christian or Arab Jew or Arab Muslim, regardless their text, Bible, Torah, New Testament, Psalms, or Quran, all of them in the Arabic language use the word Alif Lam Lam Ha. God spelled it for you. Allah. To represent the God. So it's not a foreign name. Now, uh, you may wonder why I'm getting so details on some of these things. Well, because it's possible you've been exposed to certain people's works that they know what they're doing and it's corrupt and they're playing with people's emotions. They've made a lot of money out of it. And even some of them became famous and even have government positions now just off of doing these little tricks. One of them wrote a book called The Moon God Called Allah. And if what he says in the book is true, that means Christians and Jews are also wrong. Because he says the word Allah means the moon god that Arabs worship. What he neglects to mention, he's supposed to be a famous archaeologist according to him. But, uh, well, you know, some people are just... Uh, very high up in their own mind. And he says that this moon god called Allah is what M Muslims and Arabs worship. Well, if it's true, like I said, you go to the Bible in Arabic, which is much, much older than the Latin. And the Latin goes to the 4th century with Jerome. Yet in all the Latin Bibles on page 1, Genesis, you'll find the word 17 times. Allah, Allah. Allah, Allah. In the beginning was, it says, uh, 
In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's the first line in English. That's what it says in Arabic. Only it says Allah. So immediately we need to know that this is not a wrong word. And it predates anything in English, as we already said, because English came much later. Additionally, it is the word which was accepted in Aramaic and Hebrew and in the, uh, all the Semitic languages. Even if they said something else, like Elohim, for instance, you'll find that in the Old Testament, it's called Allahumma in the Quran. So, just how you pronounce it, whether you say El or Al. And if you doubt what I'm telling you, you can check this out in any of the transliterations that they bring from the Gulf of Arabic to English, they use A-L, but if you bring them from Egypt or Morocco, they use E-L and say L. Al-Bait means the house, but if you go to Northern Africa, they say El-Bait, and they will use E-L. Same thing. It's no difference. Now, this brings us to the next word that you go to the New Testament. Eli, Eli, Eloi, Eloi, Lama, Sabachthani. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm in Anderson, Indiana. I know somebody in here has got to know what I'm talking about. There we go. <laughs> These are the two Gospels mentioning the statement made by the one on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And Eli and Eloi, depending on which way you use it, is still the same thing, means my God, my God. And in Arabic, Allahi, Allahi. Is that right? It's your language. Was that close? Close enough for government work? It's exactly right. Just me know. Arabs give me a hard time there. It's all right. Fish. Inside joke. Anyhow, what I want to mention is that a lot of times emotions overcome our common sense. And sometimes we just lay something out there without any real proof. And then when we start working on that, we just keep pushing it and pushing it. We wind up with a structure out here that's really on false ground. I want to give you one. I'm going to talk about another subject for a minute because I think it helps us to keep coming back to the other subject with something to compare it to. How many of you are familiar with the theory of evolution? You know how it works? Yeah. Well, I used to deny evolution completely when I was a Christian. I always denied evolution. But then my sister got married to this guy, and I don't know, I may put doubts in my mind. Just kidding. <laughs> no, we've had an ongoing war for 40 years. Anyhow, in Islam, we don't have this problem of creation versus evolution. Why? Because Allah in the Quran mentions that He is the one who created everything. If it exists, He created it. That's it. But he also said, He's the evolver. So He says in the Quran, if it evolved, guess who did it? I did. Solves the problem. Evolver and creation. All at the same time. He's both. Al-Khaliq, which means the one who creates, and Al-Bari, the one who shapes or changes things. Is that close? Yeah. I got him going now. So you, you, I tell <laughs> Closer and closer. The point now is that we don't have a difficulty with these people except that when we bring proof to them, we find that they'll run away. Very, very often when we've had discussions with people who are uh, uh, evolutionists, or in other words, follow Darwinism and so on, that when you bring them solid proof of something and they can't deal with it, they're just like, oh, well, whatever. And you go, wait a minute, excuse me, whatever is not what scientists are supposed to say when they're up against the wall. Let me give you an example. I may have to go bleep on one of these words because this, I read it from archaeological, uh, arche, well, say it for me. That, that word, you know, it's A, C, archaeological book that I picked up in an airport. And I was real fascinated with it because this was people who believe everything is coming out of evolution. But they had three or four scientists who said that they have discovered something under the microscope, a life form, 
that has no other origin. They said it, they said it had to start with this. This is its base form. There isn't anything that it came from. And they wrote some papers on it. When they presented these papers, in Colorado, the professor of the university there responded back to them only with two words. The first one was bull, and the other one I'll bleep. He had nothing else to say. He doesn't want to talk about it. He's not going to discuss it. But they brought, you know, like, like scientists like to do, fill up your paper thing, you know. And he's, this is his two words for them. He doesn't want to look, look at it. And today, if you want to go to the Internet, you can look it up for yourself. They're calling it intelligent design. They don't want to say there's a God, by the way. But they're calling it intelligent design. Go to Google.com or any... Uh, I like Google.com. I don't know if you ever use it. But go to that search engine and type in two words. Intelligent design. And if you want to narrow it down, put quotes on the outside. Quote, intelligent design, unquote. Do that and you'll go to these papers and you'll see... And it's amazing because, in essence, what they're coming around after all these years and saying, whoops, <laughs> now let's discuss something else. In Islam, it's forbidden to lie. We have no room to lie. You do it, you're out of Islam, just like that. If a person dies as a liar, he dies as what they call a kafir or disbeliever. He goes to hell forever. And there's no, no chance. Because the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, listen, in, ah, he's not from us. Who lies. This means that if somebody's really a Muslim, all you have to do is just ask them, did you do so and so? They have to tell you the truth. If he didn't tell the truth, then he's a liar, and if he tells a lie, he's not a Muslim. Simple as that. Now you might say, well, yeah, but what about he could have conscious reservations, white lies, blah, 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 blah. Islam doesn't have room for these kind of margins. The only thing that's the exception is the tiny thing which you can do. It's not really a lie, but like, man's married, has a wife. She comes home one day, she's got a new dress on. Okay, and it looks like, you know, the colors and everything. He's going, <laughs> she said, how do you like my new dress? He said, oh, I never saw another dress like that one. This is permissible. He can say that. Or she's serving some food and he ate it and he went, mm. and she said, what do you think about that? This is, you know what? This is so amazing. I wish you'd only serve it once a year because I don't know if I could get over it. <laughs> he means it, but he means it another way. And this is to keep, uh, you know, from fighting with your wife, something like that. It's permissible. And also to bring people back together who have been fighting, like close friends or relatives fighting with each other. You go to one and you tell the one, by the way, this one, they, they made some mistakes and probably they're too much pride. They probably would like to be have a chance to talk to you. Then you go over to the other one and tell them the same thing. You know, this one was talking to me the other day and I was mentioning you about mistakes. They have some mistakes and, you know, you're, you're a good guy. They're a good guy. This is pride. Why don't you guys think about it? And then you could have some dinner and invite them both and let them make up. And that's, that's the maximum permitted for lying. That's the maximum. Even jokes. We can't tell jokes with lies in it. If we do, it's not Islam. How many Muslims know that? Raise your hand. See? That's the way it is. Okay. Why, do you, why, why did I mention that? Well, because when we're talking about evolution, do you know how many lies have been brought out and offered to us as scientific facts over the years? And they tell us it's evolution. How many of you ever heard of what they call the tilt-down man hoax? It's quite a while ago. And, and if you read it, yourself when it came out. It came out in England about 90 years ago. So I doubt anybody here read it, but we've heard about it since then. Piltdown is a place in England where Sir Arthur Conan Doyle lived. Anybody know who that is? Yeah, and, and there's a theory that he actually is behind this, that he was going to write a story about it later, but then he either died or got cold feet because it got a lot more attention than he thought it would. And what that was is that they started to find, in an old junkyard, they started finding rare bones, fossil bones of strange things and strange antiques and so on. Well, it was proven later that actually he had access to those things because he used to travel around the world and Egypt and places and it, most likely that's where he got these things. And that he was probably going to make up some kind of story for Sherlock Holmes. He's the writer of Sherlock Holmes. But then this got international attention. It became very big uh, because why? Somebody, maybe not him, but somebody 
took part of a chimpanzee skull and part of a human skull and put 